good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you are myself siya dasha maheshwari a proud fin trauma and your faculty for management accounting welcome back welcome back to the fin tram revision boot camp ma'am what is fin tram revision boot camp in fin tram revision boot camp we have divided the entire revision boot camp into two parts in one part we will be covering revision of entire syllabus and in the second part we will be doing video question marathon you will be asking me ma'am what is video question marathon when i say video question marathon in that we will be covering concept based question comprehensive question past exam question basically there are a wide variety and flavors of question which we will be practicing so that we become champion before the exam and in the exam we passes with a flying curve and also my friend the video question marathon we have you know curated in such a way that it is exact replica of your exam pattern so the entire video question marathon has been divided into two part that section a and section b so this all this all entire thing we will be covering in the revision boot camp so without wasting any minute let's just jump in into revision boot camp and first we will be starting with the revision of entire syllabus area my friend So okay guys so let's first start with the management accounting revision session what we will be covering in this particular session we will be first talking about the syllabus area that we will be covering syllabus area so we will be talking about cost accounting material labor overhead absorption marginal costing job costing batch costing service costing process costing budgeting capital budgeting standard costing and performance measurement so we will be talking about all important concept formulas and everything which we have to you know revise before the exam from all these topics that we will be covering in this revision session we will be also talking about analysis of past exam pattern that how in the exam what is the pattern in which exams is being conducted that also we will be talking about we will be also talk i will be also giving you some exam techniques which will be very helpful for you doing the exam and it will be saving your time and also you can score a little bit more extra marks through that and i have given you some techniques during the session also and i will be giving you in the session itself so let's first start with the what with the management accounting revision session now guys if you remember in the very first session what was the first, first session introduction of management accounting in that session what we have done we have talked about what is cost what is cost accounting all the basic concept all the basic terms and terminologies that we have understood in that chapter and the first thing very first thing which i have taught you in that particular chapter was what was cost what is cost cost is anything and everything you know the value of resources which you put together to produce any good or you know to produce any services so if in that particular chapter i have given you example of t-shirt so produce for producing any t-shirt you require you know material the labor and the other expenses so the value of that material the value of the labor the value of other expenses they all comprises of what they all comprises of your cost so that's the definition which i have written over here also any outflow of item of value against which some benefit is received is called cost the second thing which we have understood over there was cost accounting if you remember we have talked about management accounting and cost accounting and what management accounting and cost accounting do we basically calculate cost then we analyze the cost that whatever cost we have incur whether it's appropriate or inappropriate and then when if it is inappropriate then we do you know you know put together some cost control techniques whichever we find you know uh, enough for in that particular situation so that's all cost accounting so cost accounting involves applying a set of principles methods and technique to determine that's cost calculation analyze whether we have uh, you know done the appropriate expenditure or it is inappropriate within the separate unit of business and also it involve cost control if we feel that whatever cost which we have incurred it's not appropriate it's more than the required amount then we will be putting cost control techniques to reduce the cost then in we have also talked about unit cost what is unit cost that is all expenses carried out to make one unit of product that means what are what is the material what is the labor what is the other expenses which you are going to you know put together to produce one unit of product so basically cost of one unit of product is you known as your cost unit it is also known as unit cost or cost per unit then we have talked about cost center what is cost center 
cost center is basically it can be any function it can be any department it can be any activity for which you are calculating the cost and for which what you are doing you are analyzing the cost so for any you know location function activity equipment for whatever whatever it is for which you are calculating the cost and you are analyzing the cost it becomes your cost center a cost center is used as collecting place for cost the cost of operating cost center is determined for the period and then this total cost is related to the cost unit which has passed through this cost center then in that chapter we have also talked about what is the need to classify the cost why it is necessary to classify the cost so over there i have explained to you that you know it is very very important to understand the cost and to calculate the cost because if you are not able to calculate the accurate cost what's going to happen you will be never able to determine your correct selling price because what is your selling price when you know that okay i am incurring 10 dollar for producing this particular goods of item and i want to you know have a profit of let's say 11 dollars so 10 plus 11 becomes your 21 dollars so that becomes your selling price so you cannot determine your correct selling price if you do not know your cost if you do not know your cost what's going to happen either you might be you know selling your product at a lower selling price let's suppose you do not know the cost and you have have decided that your selling price will be $15 and your cost itself is coming let's say $14 so you are just earning a profit of $1 this happened why because you have not calculated your cost so cost calculation is very very important to determine what to determine your selling price so for setting the selling price also for decision making purpose and lots of activity of business when you, we talk about lots of activity of business let's say expansion mergers acquisition it's very very important to whenever you are undergoing some new plan project product whatever you need to identify the cause that what will be the amount of expenditure i'm going to incur from you know uh, going to incur because when you will be you know how you will be determining that whether i should do this particular activity or not by analyzing the cost and revenue so you know the revenue but if you are not going to know the cost what's going to happen how you will be going to compare if you know revenue if you know the cost you can you know compare them and let's say the revenue is $15 let's assume like this and the cost is $10 so what's the answer the profit which is coming is of $5 $15 uh, revenue $10 cost so, uh, your profit is for $5 so obviously you will be going to you know carry on this particular project but if you know that the revenue is $15 and you don't know anything you don't have any idea about the cost what's going to happen you cannot compare it you need something to compare you know revenue so cost is the thing which you are going to compare with the revenue and then only you will be you know you can do the complete analysis whether we should undergo this project product or whatever activity it is in the business otherwise if you do see revenue and cost they both are very very important to understand or to take any decision because revenue is what revenue is a benefit and cost is what causes the expenditure which you are incurring to get that benefit so if you do not know the cost and if you do not know the revenue both of these pillars are very very important to make any decision so you need to know because if you remember in capital budgeting itself or i have taught you one technique that is npv technique and what was that technique present value of cash inflow minus present value of cash outflow if it comes positive you can undergo this particular you know activity if it is come negative you cannot undergo that activity so that means that your cash outflow and inflow both are very important to determine what to determine or to take a correct decision so yes uh, if you know class calculation or classification is important for taking any decision same goes with the planning future activity because if you are planning any future activity or taking any decision you need to know the cost firstly then we have talked about cost classification now cost is being classified on different different basis on the basis of nature on the basis of function on the basis of product and period on the basis of behavior so on the basis of nature if i talk about cost is being classified into material labor and expenses and that's why we have done the entire chapter of material the entire chapter of labor and the entire chapter of expenses on the basis of what on the basis of class classification so anything which is you know material can be you know it can be direct material or indirect material direct material which you can relate to the production activity or which is you know engage in the production activity that is your direct material and indirect material is what material can be direct material or indirect material same goes with the labor direct labor and indirect labor and same goes with the overheads direct expenses and indirect expenses 
So what is the concept of direct and indirect? You can just pause the video right now and you can just answer in your mind what is the direct material and the indirect material. Let's just unpause it and I am going to explain you. So direct material is something which is, you know, which find place in the production activity. So if you remember, I have given you the example of t-shirt. And in that example, I have explained you that the, this cloth is your direct material. But the lubricant oil, the, you know, thread, the nails, all these items, the buttons, which are not going to increase in the same proportion in which your production is going to increase, are what are all of your are indirect material. Same goes with the direct labor, indirect labor. Labor which is engaged in the production activity is considered as direct labor. And the other labor because of one who is working in the administrative department, finance department, research and development department, maintenance department, all of them are known as the indirect labor. And same goes with the direct expense and direct expenses. Direct expenses are those expenses which are basically what? Which are basically involved in the again the production activity or increases if the production is going to increase or decreases in the same proportion in which production is decreases. And indirect expenses are what? Indirect expenses are not, you know, which does not changes or which does not have impact of the production activity like your rent even if you are if you have taken any premises on the rent if you are producing 2000 units then also your rent will be 20 let's suppose it is 200 dollars then also your rent is 200 dollar and even if you are not producing any unit then also your rent is 200 dollars so it's what it's basically your indirect expenses if you remember we have talked about the prime cause that's direct material direct labor and direct expenses so direct material direct labor and direct expenses combinedly called as prime cost and the overhead is known as indirect material, indirect labor and indirect cost. Then we have also done one more formula that's the production cost formula that's prime cost plus production overhead. So basically this plus this becomes production cost. And then there is non-manufacturing overhead which is basically your selling and distribution overhead, your uh, you know administrative overhead, finance cost, research cost. And the total cost includes the production cost and the non-manufacturing overhead. And there's one more formula, the conversion cost. Basically, uh, what is the cost which you're going to incur to convert your raw material into the finished goods? That's basically direct labor, direct expense, and only production overhead. In that, you will not be including the non-production overhead. Lots of students get confused in that, this particular thing that what they do uh, in conversion costs, they include direct labor, direct expense, and all the overheads. You don't have to include all the overhead. You have to include only the production overhead. The selling distribution overhead, administrative overhead, finance overhead and the research cost this will not be included in your conversion cost clear okay moving on to the next category of the function like next category on the basis of which you can classify the cost is by function so by function if i talk about it is production and manufacturing cost so all the cost like all the and one more thing all the cost which you are going to incur in related to production or manufacturing that will be coming over here then selling and selling cost, all the costs which you are incurring, it's a indirect cost which you are incurring to promote sales and retaining the customer. And then there's a distribution cost, which is it's, it is also an indirect cost which you are going to incur for you know dispatching the goods and delivering it to the customer. Then administrative cost, it's again an indirect cost which you are going to incur for office related expenses. Financial cost, again an indirect cost which are basically your interest charges and the interest paid on the loan cost for legal documentation required to acquire loans. So that's there. And the research cost again is an indirect cost which will be including your uh, you know cost incurred before making a product for research work. One thing which you have to uh, understand the selling cost, distribution, administrative, financial research, all of these are indirect costs. The production and the manufacturing cost, this include your direct cost as well as indirect costs over here. Prime cost, your direct cost is included and production overhead, your indirect cost is included. So only the production and manufacturing cost will include direct and indirect cost. All the other are indirect cost. All the others are the indirect costs. Okay. Moving on to the next category that is product and the period cost. So product cost is any cost which you are going to incur to produce any goods or services. And when I talk about period cost, it's a fixed cost. Okay, fixed cost which does not change. It's going to remain fixed for that particular period of time. So that's what I have returned. Cost incurred on making product is called product cost. So all material, labor, expense for production. And period cost, the cost does not change which remain fixed. 
then on the basis of behavior we have uh, you know this analysis if you remember we have talked about the graphs and a lot of more things in this particular category so variable cost this is the cost which vary with the production okay production or the number of units you are producing so if the number of units which you are producing are increasing your variable cost is also going to increase in totality but per unit variable cost is going to remain same what i said per unit variable cost will not change it will not change with the level of activity but the total variable cost is going to increase or decrease with the change in what with the change in your level of activity talking about fixed cost we have done the graphs the you know in the sessions itself and you have to revise them when i talk about fixed cost fixed cost remain constant the total fixed cost that's going to that does not change with the level of activity let's suppose your rent expenditure is $200 so it's not going to change it's remain intact whether you produce 0 units 200 units 2000 units okay but per unit per unit fixed cost change with the level of activity okay so per unit fixed cost is going to change with the level of activity if you are going to produce more your fixed cost per unit is going to decline this we have done and explained we have you know understood over there then the next kind of cost is step fixed cost step fixed cost is a cost which is not like which remain constant for a for a range of you know for a range of activity and then uh, when the when it crosses that range it's going to increase so let's suppose for you know for producing 0 to 100 units your um, your step fixed cost is let's say 100 dollars so whether you produce 0 unit or whether you produce 100 unit your step fixed cost is let's say 100 dollar as you are going to cross this 100 you know 100 uh, units level and let's suppose you are producing let's suppose from 101 to 200 level it's 200 so as you are going to cross the 100 unit level your step fixed cost is going to increase to 200 level so it's it's going to remain intact and fixed for a level of activity as you cross that range it's going to increase and then again remain constant in that again remain going to constant in the next range and so on So the cost remain fixed for a certain level of production and then increase by a constant amount and when will then and will then remain again you know constant fixed again another level of production and has been achieved is called a step fixed cost then there is a semi variable cost semi variable cost is a cost which has two component one a fixed component and another variable component okay so this contain two fixed and variable component therefore partly affected by the change in the level of activity because it has a variable component so it will be affected with the change of level of activity okay so we have done graphs related to it in the session itself now uh, regarding the semi variable cost i have teach you the high low method what is a you know high low method that is total cost at the highest level minus total cost at the lowest level divided by the total units at the highest level minus total units at the lowest level this give you as a variable cost per unit once you get the variable cost unit you can easily calculate fixed cost unit how total cost at the highest you know uh, highest activity level minus the variable cost and how you will be calculating variable cost unit at the highest level multiplied by the variable cost that's going to give you variable cost so total cost minus variable cost that's going to give you fixed cost now the next thing which we have done in our sessions was material these the uh, when we are talk about material in material we have talked about the direct material and the indirect material so material is something with which product is manufactured wood is a manufacturer is used to manufacture chair so wood is a material now material is again of two type direct material and indirect material as i have already explained you direct material is something which is used in the production activity which is going to be used in the production activity so the cloth which is being used for manufacturing of this t-shirt is what that's a direct material and indirect material is something which is not going to be used used in the production activity itself or like suppose you know you have acs in your premises and the ment for the maintenance purpose you need some material for its maintenance purpose that particular material is your indirect material okay or the cleaning material for the premises that is your indirect material so there are lots of example of indirect material in the organizations uh that can comprises of your indirect material so indirect material is something which is can which will be not used in the production activity it's not used in the production activity or uh, it's something which is being used for the maintenance purpose or for you know smooth running of the organization 
then we have talked about inventories so when i talk about inventories inventories are of three kind the raw material wip finished good raw material the basic like very basic stuff okay which something which you have purchased and which has not undergone any change when let's say this cotton cotton cloth which i have let's suppose i have purchased this fabric for manufacturing of this t-shirt so the fabric which i have purchased which has not undergone any change will be categorized as my raw material once that fabric has been you know cut it and you know you have done some manufacturing activity on it uh, and still it it is in the process of manufacturing so you have done cutting on that you know on that uh, cloth but you have not stitched it so it is a wip work in progress something is going on so little bit work has been completed little bit work has to be completed so cutting part has been done stitching part is need to be done and once the stitching part will be done and finishing is done it will become finished goods so when some material is in the process or undergoing is in an undergoing process it becomes wip and when that material finally converted into to the finished goods when that fabric converted into this t-shirt that t-shirt will become your finished goods so the first is raw material no uh, change has been done second is wip some change has been done and some is yet to be done finished goods all changes has been done and finished good has been produced then we have talked about different different techniques of inventory control so the very first technique of inventory control is eoq what was eoq eoq is basically we have talked about that we need a level where our ordering cost and our holding cost should be equal and minimum and also we need to know that at one point of time how many units we should order so that we have sufficient amount of unit we do not want overstocking of units you know of raw material we do not want understocking because i have already explained you what will overstocking will be do if we will be you know uh, you know if, if if in our warehouses we are stocking more than uh, required amount of inventories there's a huge possibility that lots of inventory may got you know destroyed damaged before the consumption or we require a bigger area to store them that also you know going to engage more holding cost so we want a appropriate amount of inventory that should be ordered so that my ordering cost and my holding cost should be minimum and the lower and that will be provided by which formula that is being provided by the formula of eoq now in eoq we the size of the order for which total of ordering cost and carrying cost is minimum then we have talked about the ordering cost and or carrying cost so ordering cost is a cost which you incur to place a order so it include your transportation cost your inventory inspection cost or i would say you know the documentation procedure which you do to place a order that all is your inventory cost so preparation of purchase order employee cost which are you know engage in the purchase department procurement of in, you know material and and transportation inspection cost these all are your what these all are your ordering cost when i talk about carrying cost or the holding cost the cost which you incur to hold the inventories in the warehouse till the time they are not transferred to the production department or not consumed by the production department so till the time they are stored in the warehouses that's your carrying cost it include the cost which you have invested in the inventory cost of storage the insurance cost of capital pilferage obsolescence these all cost comprises of your carrying cost now by this particular formula we get that this should be our order you know this should be our order level or i would say this should be our number this is the number of unit which we should order in one particular order so that we are not holding less units and we are not holding more units which is given by this formula 2 into annual requirement to cost per order divided by carrying cost per unit per annum and if you have to calculate annual ordering cost cost of placing an order multiplied by number of orders and if you have to calculate total annual holding cost that will be holding cost per unit of inventory multiplied by the average inventory this is order size divided by 2 or eoq divided by 2 this a and divided by o q is means annual demand divided by your uh, eoq or order size then the next thing in this uh, material chapter we have talked about stock control level what is stock control level in the organization we uh, you know defines and specify different different order level the minimum level the maximum level the e reorder level which basically specify that maximum level specify this is the maximum amount of inventory you should be holding minimum level specify this is the minimum amount of inventory which you should be holding reorder level specify that when you strike at this particular level it's a time to place a fresh order so reorder level uh, is a measure of inventory at which replenishment of order should be made basically when it's it's a point which specify that it's a time to place a fresh order 
Average inventory, that's basically the average amount of inventory which you're holding in your stock. It can be maximum plus minimum divided by two or buffer safety stock plus reorder level divided by two. Minimum stock level, that's the minimum amount of inventory which you should be holding at any point of time. If you're holding anything less than the minimum stock level, then you are in a dangerous situation because you are in a situation where you can, you know, stock out at any point of time and that's going to do what? That's going to, you know, hamper your prediction. So if you know that this is my minimum stock level, you should, you will be well aware in advance that okay, we should never go below this level and that will save you from the situation or position of stock out and that will be very very helpful to you so that's the reason we specify these level it is the lowest level of material or stock which may be maintained in hand or at all time so there is a no stoppage of prediction due to the non availability of material and how we calculate reorder level minus average consumption rate into average reorder period then there is a maximum stock level that's the maximum amount of inventory which you should hold at any point of time so basically the objective of specifying this level is that we get well aware that we should not be holding more than this much amount of inventory so that we can prevent overstocking of inventory which in turn is going to prevent you know which is in turn is going to lower down our carrying cost or holding cost if we have not specified this particular level what's going to happen we may be holding a huge amount of inventory or more than the required amount of inventory Entry, which in turn is going to you know increase which might be increasing our holding or carrying cost which is somewhere not good for organization so it's the highest level of inventory which you should be holding at any point of time any quantity beyond this level create extra amount of expenditure due to engagement of fund cost of storage obsolescence these all are your holding cost only the formula for it is reorder level plus reorder quantity minus minimum consumption rate into minimum reorder period. Reorder quantity is also known as EOQ. The next thing which we have done over here was economic batch quantity. Economic batch quantity concept is very much similar to EOQ. EOQ concept tells us that this is the amount of, you know, in when you are placing an order, this is your order size. This tells us, EBQ tells us that this, like when you are producing goods in a batch, in one batch, this is the amount of, you know, units which you should be producing. And again, the concept comes the same way that, you know, you want minimum setting up cost and the carrying cost. Over there, there was an ordering in the holding cost. Over here, there's a setting up cost and the holding cost so you want minimum of these two costs and that can be provided by you know putting this particular formula so it gave us the optimum batch quantity or economic product quantity and is measured to determine the quantity of unit that you should be producing at a minimum average cost in a given batch or production run the formula over here is 2 co divide in multiplied by d divided by ch1 minus dr the cost of setting up batch demand per order holding up CH is holding uh, cost per unit per period and R is the production run replacement or production rate per period. This formula is little bit different from the EOQ formula. So what lots of students do, lots of students just get confused in these two formula, EOQ formula and EBQ formula. Please don't get confused in these two formula and write these two formula at separate places and have a clarity on these two formula. Also in these two concepts, lots of students make this mistake. They just, you know, shuffle EOQ with EBQ and EBQ with EOQ. So you don't have to confuse in these two things that remember that thing. Okay. Then the next thing which we have done or I would, we should revise is stock taking. What was stock taking? Stock taking is basically you are trying to, you know, uh, revising that what like you are trying to measuring that what is my physical stock with your stock in books of accounts you can do stock taking by periodical or perpetual and continuous so in periodical stock taking stocks are periodical stock taking stocks are counted and updated on specific date usually at the end of the accounting period so in, in your you know your periodic stock taking stock taking is being done at the end of accounting period it's not being done on a continuous or regular basis whereas in perpetual stock taking you will be counting stock every like whenever the transaction is going to happen you will be doing you will be counting and updating it in books of accounts and counting it physically so valuable items are checked more frequently and uh, for valuable item you should adopt continuous stock taking and for item of less value you can go for periodical stock taking then we have talked about stock valuation methods so there is a fifo method lifo method and the weighted average FIFO method says first and first out, LIFO say last and first out and weighted average, you will be taking price at weighted average price. So FIFO method, in this method, the inventory is used for the earliest purchase. Earliest price of material is, is used for each issue. If price are rising, issue price will be lower and vice versa. Closing stock is valued at the most recent price. 
If I talk about LIFO, most recent price of material is used for each issue. If prices are rising, issue price will be higher and closing stock is valued at the earliest price. And when I talk about weighted average, in this method, a weighted average rate is calculated before each stock issue whenever two or more quantities at a different rate is found in balance and all issues are made at a weighted average price. Regarding this particular concept, I would be saying you that practice practical quotient regarding FIFO, LIFO weighted average because you know small amount of MCQ based quotient can come from this particular topic. Then we have also discussed about the inventory account. So over here, opening balance is going to come over here. Closing balance is purchased, is returned to store, issued to prediction, uh, whether if it's a direct material, it will be considered WIP indirect as a prediction overhead, return of, return to supplier, theft and losses. Documentation regarding the material, we have talked about purchase requisition. So it is being sent by storekeeper to purchase that, uh, you know, purchase department. Whenever store, store department feels there is a time to purchase goods, they will be asking it with which document, which purchase requisition document. Then purchase order. So whenever purchase department has to place an order, they will be using this particular document purchase order and it will be sending it to the selected or the existing supplier. Then delivery note, delivery note is being sent by supplier. The supplier send delivery note to the customer with the goods. Good receive note in some organization, there's a particular good receive section. So this good receive section is going to prepare and send this particular note to the other department telling them that I have received the goods. Then store or material requisition notes. When I talk about store or material requisition note, it is being, you know, will be completed when material are needed from stores by the production department. So when production department, you know, require goods, they will be asked and how they will be asking, uh, they will be asking to the store department by this particular document that store or material requisition document. Then the next thing which we have done is labor. So regarding labor, if you remember, we have done you know, again, the labor concept that it's a direct labor and the indirect labor. Direct labor is a labor which is engaged in what? In the production activity and the indirect one are not engaged in the production activity. They may be involved in the administrative work or, you know, in research development work or maintenance work. So these are that. Then if I talk about remuneration methods, so you can make payment to labor through time related and you can also, you know, do payment through piece work. When I talk about time related, so in time related, how you will be doing payment. So the formula goes very, very simple. That's total hour worked into the basic rate of pay. And if there's an overtime, then overtime hours into the overtime basic premium per hour. And in the piece, you will be paying on the basis of number of piece produced. So number of good units produced into the standard rate per piece. Then there's some bonus and incentive schemes also. So the two schemes which we have studied is the Halse and the Rowan. In Halse, you will be giving them 50%, whatever time they have saved, it's 50% you will be giving them as the bonus. So time allowed minus time saved divided by two into time rate. And in row one, you will be giving bonus. This is only the bonus uh, component. Time taken divided by time allowed into time rate into time saved. Then we have talked about idle time, the time which is being wasted, which is non-productive, that's being idle time. So basically in idle time, no work has been done. It might be because, you know, the labor are uh, very, you know, you have the supervision was not done properly. They are wasting their time. Or it is a possibility that, you know, they do not have proper material or machine has broken down or there's no electricity. So there are lots of reasons because of which it is a possibility that production hampered or production put on a hold so the time which is paid at a normal basic rate but no work is done it is also known as a non-predictive time it is always treated as an indirect labor cost both for the direct and the indirect labor it cannot be in overtime but overtime may arise due to a vital time so if suppose in the normal hours you are not you have wasted the time because of any reason it is a possibility then you have to work a little extra and that little little extra is known as your overtime also so because of idle time it is a possibility that overtime can arise now what are the reasons of idle time production disruption you know pro production has hampered because of you know material shortage or electricity breakdown there's lots of reason machine has broken down shortage of material has ha happened inefficient scheduling you have not done the proper scheduling of different different shift then poor labor supervision so supervision is not done properly because of that lots of labor are sitting idly they are wasting their time gossiping and doing you know what all in the you know office hours and in the hours in the normal hours so that's that payment for tea breaks and uh, payment for rest periods, sudden fall in the demand and strike at the supplier piece. So these are the reasons because of which idle time can happen. 
Now, if I talk about total hour paid is predictive plus non-predictive, total hour work will only be the predictive hour and idle time is the time allowed minus time actually being taken. Then if I talk about overtime, overtime is a time which you have worked little extra. You have a normal hour, 9 to 5, if after 5 you work you know, for 2 hours or 3 hours. So these 2 hours or 3 hours will be considered as your overtime hours. And you will be paid the basic wages plus overtime premium. Basic wage will be considered your direct wage. Overtime premium will be considered your indirect wages. There are some of the formulas or the ratios by which we can identify the efficiency of the labor. So the first formula which we have is the activity ratio or the production volume ratio. Over here we basically standard hours divided by budget hours into 100 and we basically try to compare what how the overall prediction compares to the plan level. So what is your overall con uh, you know, prediction in comparison to what you have planned. The capacity ratio measures the extent of worker capacity by the working hour has been achieved in a period with the planned labor utilization. So actual hour work divided by budgeted hours into 100. Then you have efficiency ratio. This ratio measures the efficiency of labor force by comparing equal and standard hours for the predict produce and the actual hours. It is also known as the predictivity ratio. So it's the standard hours divided by actual hours into 100. Then there's a labor turnover. Labor turnover basically tells us that how many laborers or employees are leaving the organization. This ratio should never be high because it's high. That means there's a lots of you know fluctuation and shuffle in the labor force in one particular year. So you try to keep this ratio minimum. It's not possible. You cannot do this ratio zero, but you try to keep it minimum. So labor turnover is a measure of the proportion of people leaving relative to average number of people have been employed. So number of leaver who require replacement divided by average number of people. Now, labor turnover, there can be some reasons which can be avoidable, some cannot be unavoidable. So, why employee leave the organization? The avoidable one is basically you are not remunerating it properly. The working conditions are not good. There's a lack of training, so they do not feel that they can have some amount of you know exposure over there, or the employee do not feel their growth. They feel that their growth growth is striked, so they do not want to continue. Lack of promotion or splits, and the unavoidable one is employer retires so you cannot do anything he has some illness or death because of which he cannot continue the job family reason the female employees they have you know some pregnancy issues or married so they have need a break in between so because of that also relocation it might be possible that you know so your spouse or the other you know your other family members are relocating to other place so you also want to relocate so you have to leave the job so some of them are unavoidable of those those which are unavoidable you cannot do anything but the one which are avoidable you have they are matter of concern and you have to look forward and see what you can then regarding them then accounting for labor, so the wage control account on this side, there will be bank, the payment which you are doing and on this side, the payment which you are doing to direct labor, the indirect labor, the overtime premium you are doing, the idle time payment you are doing, the shift allowance and the sick pay. Then there is an overhead. What is overhead? All the indirect expenses, indirect expenses related to the material, indirect expenses related to labor, indirect expenses related to other expenses, they all classified as what overhead. So indirect expenses that cannot be directly identified with specific cost unit or cost center is categorized as overhead. Now prediction or manufacturing overhead, the overhead which is related, the indirect expenses which is related to the prediction department or manufacturing department, they are termed as prediction or manufacturing overhead like you know the furniture, a glue used in the furniture, the supervisor salary, the electricity used in the uh, in the production. Non-production or non-manufacturing overhead, the uh, indirect expenses which is not related to the production activity, but they are related to selling, you know, selling and distribution department, they are related to administrative department, they are related to finance department, research department, they will be categorized and termed as non-production or non-manufacturing overhead. So selling in this overhead, distribution overhead, administrative overhead, and finance overhead. Prediction overhead are recovered by absorbing them into cost of predict and this process is called absorption. Now we have in, in you know absorption costing we have talked about allocation apportionment. So what is allocation? When one particular overhead can be you know directly linked to one particular department, there is no sharing, nothing sharing is being done. It's basically expense one. This is directly linked to department one. That means it is directly allocated to department one. This is known as allocation of overhead. So the cost that relate to single cost center, that means department are allocated to the cost center. When I talk about apportionment, that means this expense one is being incurred in, you know, uh, it's being incurred because depart because some of the reasons are department one, department two, department three. So this expense is being shared by department one, department two, department three on some of the basis. So let's say there's a rent expenditure. 
uh, if in the in the premises in which you know let's suppose you are paying rent of two hundred dollar, and in that particular premises only department one is being you know operating. So that will like that two hundred dollar will be directly allocated to department one. But in that particular premises, department one, two, three are you know working and operating. So that two hundred dollar will be shared with the you know with department one, two, and three. So they are going to do apportionment of that particular expenditure. So apportionment where cost uh, overhead cost is common. Combined or joined to more than one cost center, and therefore need to shared out amongst the relevant cost center based on the benefit received by each cost center. Then overhead uh, apportionment department based into total overhead divided by total basis. So let's say rent is your uh, two hundred dollar. What will be your basis overhead area like the floor area? And uh, let's suppose there's a thousand square foot over you know floor area. Every department, the four department is occupying two fifty two fifty square area. So it will be you know divided in equal ratio in all the four departments. Then reapportionment. Sometimes the cost which you are going to incur in the service department that is also need to be you know finally uh, apportioned to the production department. So the cost, the indirect cost which you have incurred to the service department, when that cost is reapportioned, then when that cost is transferred to the production department, to the production department, that is known as the reapportionment. So the process in which service cost center total uh, apportionment to you know apportion to the production cost center. And you are going to nil the service cost center cost as zero. That is known as service uh, reapportionment. So in reapportionment, the service cost center total uh, cost, whatever total cost you have incurred in the service cost center, that will be uh, apportioned to the production departments, so that you know it can be incorporated in the final cost. That entire procedure is known as the reapportionment. You can do the direct uh, step down and reciprocal, whatever method suits you depending upon the situation. The cost of each production and service cost center is reapportioned to the production cost centers only. Instead, step down uh, used when production service cost center work or you know provide service to other production service center as well as to the production service center. And reciprocal when you know used where production service cost center cost work for each as well as provide service cost center for cost center. So, depending upon the situation, you are going to use the method and situation we have already done a practical question regarding them and situation I have already explained you. Then the absorption rate. So, how to calculate? That's basically budgeted uh, overheads divided by budgeted activity level. This activity level can be on the basis of machine hour, direct labor hour, number of units produced. The base can be anything depending upon the question. Then we have a concept of under absorption, over absorption. So, what we do in the absorption costing, we basically you know use uh, this rate absorption rate, and by that rate we basically calculate the absorbed overhead. If your absorbed overheads are more than your uh, actual overhead, that means you have absorbed more, and that is a situation of uh, over absorption. Extra, you know, when extra overhead charge in production cost than the actual. So if your absorbed overhead is more than your actual overhead, that's over absorption. And when your absorbed overhead is less than your actual overhead, it's known as under absorption. Clear? So how you are going to calculate it? We have done practical questions regarding this also. First, you will be calculating overhead absorption rate, that is budgeted overheads divided by budgeted activity level. Then you will be calculating overhead absorbed, that is overhead absorption rate multiplied by the actual activity level. Please remember, when you are calculating absorbed overhead, you have to take the rate and you have to multiply with the actual activity level. Now you got your absorbed overhead. Actual overheads is generally given in the question. You have to compare them. You have to compare your absorbed overhead, this thing, with your actual overhead. If your absorbed overhead is more than actual overhead, that means it's a over uh, absorption situation if your absorbed overhead is less than the actual overhead then this is the under absorption situation okay guys and how you are going to deal with this situation if it is an uh, over absorption then you have to simply you know subtract the cost but if it is under absorption you have to use a supplementary rate and you have to then by using that supplementary rate you have to add in the cost of sales and you have to also add in the closing stock okay then we have the next thing which we have to revise is the marginal cost. Marginal cost is a concept where we make decision on the basis of contribution. Contribution is a very important part. And over here, we basically, what is contribution? Contribution is your selling cost, selling price basically minus variable cost. So you will be subtracting only variable cost and you will be getting contribution. Okay. From contribution, you will be subtracting fixed cost and then you will be getting the profit thing. Okay. 
so whatever decisions you are going to make in the marginal costing those decisions are based on the contribution in absorption costing you make decision on the basis of profit but in marginal costing you make decision on the basis of contribution so over here i have given you the entire this thing that sales minus cost of sales and what cost of sales comprises of this is your cost of sales that's opening inventory variable cost of production and uh, less closing inventory and this is your total cost of sales and you will also be including other variable cost so by you know subtracting variable cost of production and other variable cost you will be obtaining contribution from this contribution you will be subtracting fixed cost and then you got profit so over here you know your opening and closing inventories they are being valued at the variable cost of production if we i talk about absorption costing in absorption costing your opening and closing inventories are valued at the full cost but in marginal costing the opening and closing inventories are valued only at the variable cost and the fixed cost whatever you are incurring that will be subtracted from the contribution if you look about this absorption costing over here the cost of sales comprises of opening inventory variable cost of production fixed cost of uh, production and the closing inventory subtracted but these inventory valuation if i talk about they are done at the full cost in the early in the marginal costing the opening inventory and closing inventories are valued only at the variable cost also the cost of sales include fixed overhead fixed production over fixed overheads which is not being included in the marginal costing so over here you after subtracting cost of sales if there's an and because of that only the under absorption and over absorption situation occurs so you will be getting gross profit from gross profit you will be subtracting all the non production cost non production cost whether the variable or the fixed this can be variable or fixed that is subtracted here in this part all the production basically absorption costing may do you know whatever differentiation on the basis of production and non production marginal costing do differentiation on the basis of variable and you know fixed so over here all the production cost has been subtracted and you got gross profit from gross profit you are subtracting all the non production cost whether it's fixed or variable and then you got the final profit and loss okay <clears throat> then we have you know some questions which we have done in which basically if you have to if, if if profit is given as per marginal costing and you have to come at profit at per absorption costing how you will be doing that so this is profit as per marginal costing if there is increase and decrease in stock so increase increase means like your closing stock is more than opening stock so if you are if that is the situation you will be adding and if there is decrease in stock you will be subtracting multiplied by the fixed production overhead rate so you have to that again how you will be calculating fixed production overhead rate the budgeted fixed overhead divided by budgeted activity level that's going to give you the absorption rate for fixed overhead from you will be multiplying that rate with the change in the stock if it is increase in the stock positively if it is decrease in the stock negatively you will be considering and subtracting it from this profit and you will be uh, coming at at profit under absorption costing then what is job costing job costing is a costing it's a specific costing where cost is being calculated for for every job because every job is different from you know an, every another job it's being used in a small organization like a bakery unit or something like that where every job which you are going to do is totally different from the another one so job cost is a cost unit which consists of single order or contract job costing a single order undertaken to customer special requirement and usually for a shorter duration and it relates to costing where each unit of batch is output as unit so every unit which you are producing it's totally different from one another you are producing goods on the customer requirement and customer specifications this create the need for cost of each unit is to be calculated separately so over here whatever units you are producing for every unit you will be calculating cost separately and differently when i talk about batch costing it's again a form of specific order costing but over here whatever you are producing you will producing in batches so within the batch whatever goods you are producing they are same but across the batches the products will differ and uh, within uh, each batch the number the number of units which you are producing are identical but each batch will be different so across the batches the the difference is going to come and how you will be calculating cost per unit in batch total production cost of batch divided by number of unit in batch then there is a service costing service costing is being uh, you know utilized in the service industry when i talk about service industry it's basically your restaurant industry the it industry the hospi hospitality industry the hotels the hospitals the education industry these all are service industry the industry which is not producing product which is providing you services so the services they are providing they are of intangible nature output is intangible you cannot touch it rather than tangible product they are uh, perishable services are not stored you cannot so store any services 
and uh, you cannot buy them in bulk and services performed and consumed simultaneously so when you are you know providing the service it's going to be consumed simultaneously and uh, nature and output is never standardized it's not standardized because there's a human intervention so whenever suppose you know you are going to produce any any services whenever you're providing any services let's talk about saloons so whenever they you are going for haircut sometime they give you a good haircut sometime it's a bad day you get a bad haircut even you are your you know the person from whom you are getting the cut is the same because there's a human intervention sometime he is a is in very good mood and he performed his whatever services is providing he's performed in a very well manner and sometime he might have some you know irritation he's not in that good mood so that irritation and not in good mood effect came in your haircut and he has given you a drastically very bad haircut so what is happening over here the thing which is happening is that he's he's not a robot so he, he will not be going to give you same haircut every time you visit his saloon every time you're going to visit his saloon he will be giving you sometime good sometime bad because there's a human intervention cost uh, nature in service industry the high proportion of cost incurred are indirect as compared to direct so the major cost contribution in service industry is indirect in comparison to direct composite cost unit when more than one cost unit is being used like passenger per kilometer or patient per night or cost per passenger these all are known are known as the composite cost unit so in transport company the passenger per kilometer turn kilometer uh, these are known as the service cost unit education student per subject hospital patient per night canteen meal per uh, served measure the service cost unit service cost can be measured with the following formula service cost total cost divided by number of service occupied in the period then there is uh, another thing that's process costing what is process costing in process costing whatever goods you are producing they are homogeneous same they pass through the process which they are passing is the same exactly same so over here the average cost is net cost of input divided by expected output when i talk about expected output it's input minus the normal loss and net cost of input is basically total cost minus the scrap value expected output is what you expect to get out of the process another feature of process costing is that the output of one process might become input of the next process and uh, process costing is basically applicable in those industries which are producing homogeneous product in a large quantity there are two concept normal loss and abnormal loss so normal loss is something which is going to happen some amount of you know input you are going to lose during the production process either due to evaporation or due to you know it's a normal procedure which because of which some amount of uh, input you are going to lose so that's basically normal some units might be lost and if the unit if the loss is not more than the expected loss that's known as normal loss and expected output is an input minus normal loss unit and total cost of input minus the scrap value of normal loss divided by input unit minus normal loss unit that's the formula and if no scrap value is being given then you will be considering scrap value as nil and if normal loss has a scrap value then you will be subtracting the scrap value if normal loss when whatever you have you know deter, or you know you are thinking or you have decided that this much amount of normal loss you will be having if that um, extent is more than your expectation that uh, more thing the whatever the extra loss you have incurred that extra loss will be termed as abnormal loss so if the actual loss is more than the expected loss that extra or the excess is considered as the abnormal loss and it arises when your actual output is uh, uh, output from a process is less than the expected output so if your actual units are less than the expected unit the, there's an abnormal loss again how you will be calculating average cost per unit in this particular case total cost of input minus the scrap value of normal loss input unit minus the normal loss unit and the value of abnormal loss is average cost per unit multiplied by the abnormal loss unit then equivalent prediction sometimes what happens some of the units you know are in the process of uh, i would say in the process and you have to consider them and in that particular process so the actual number of unit in the process multiplied by the percentage of work completed those are termed as the uh, equivalent to units the next thing which we have done is budget what is budget budget is basically you are planning and plotting whatever you are going to do in the next year in the next quarter you are making a plan regarding it in the present time so it's a budget is a quantitative expression of plan and action prepared in advance of the period to which it relate what is the purpose of budget 
so budget are set to make process towards the achievement of long term gland so basically you are making project budget so that you have a proper guideline a road map that in the next quarter in the next year what we are going to do what, what will be our prediction what will be the cost we are going to incur it so that you are planning your future so that uh, when it's actually going to happen you have a guidance or you have a road map that this is the amount of cost we have to incur or this is the amount of units we should produce so that's that so a framework for responsibility accounting budget are used to make departmental manager responsible for the area you're planning future so budget incorporate future development and you are planning that you can utilize your resources very well so you till best utilization of resources budgeting process allocate resources to their boss possible manner and also for cost controlling procedure also because when you are going to plan in advance and whenever you know whatever the actual cost you are going to incur you can compare your budgeted cost with the actual cost and you can see that whether we have done the over expenditure or whatever expenditure whether we have done it's within the budgets so by that also you can analyze your working that what whatever we are doing is is it as per the budget or whether we have gone little extra so budget in advance set cost that should be matched with the activity budget cost define the limit of expenditure that this is this is the amount of expenditure i have to incur then it obviously going to ensure proper coordination interdependence of department is taken into account while setting budget so you have to you know understand that also and it's going to motivate the employees budget target motivate employees to improve their performance once you budget is what you are setting targets and if suppose employee achieve that target they will be you know they will get motivated oh we have achieved the target we have done good because every time when you suppose you set that i want to score 80 marks in mm and suppose you scored it you will feel good and let's suppose so you will feel good that i have targeted to achieve 80 and i scored it so you are you know you feel uh, happy and feel confident about it then there are two approach for making the budget the top down approach in this particular approach only the management which is like the top management is involved and they are going to make the budget and they will be intimating the middle management and the uh, you know the lower management this is the budget we we have settled it for and uh, the middle management and the lower management have to execute it in the budget making procedure the middle management and the lower management has nothing to do they are not involved it whereas the bottom up approach in this approach the middle management the lower management also participate you know the advice is being taken by the top management and uh, because they are the one who are actually going to execute it so they have they know the ground reality so the advices are being taken from them and on the basis of those suggestion advice whatever you say the top management is going to prepare the budget so in the bottom up approach there is involvement of lower management and the middle management but in the top down approach there is no involvement of it So this is where budget are set by the high level of management, and then they are going to communicate to the lower management of uh, management to whose area of responsibility they relate. So it it's a imposed budget. There is no participation. Whereas in the bottom up approach, this approach is used for budgeting where lower management are involved in setting budgets, and it's known as the participating budgets. Then there is a functional budget. That's a sales budget. Sales budget is see in most of the organization, the key budget or the principal budget is the sales budget. First, you will be deciding that in the next year, what will be my demand and what will be my sales. When you decided that, then you will be deciding that what will be my prediction. Then you will be deciding that what will be in the number of you know material I require to purchase or what will be my material usage. Then you will be also decide deciding that now if I have to produce this much amount of units, what will be my labor requirement. So normally, sales budget is being considered as the key budget. so it is being uh, already established that the budget preparation process begins with the principal budget which is a sales budget is subject to the market demand so it's mostly the principal budget and hand sales budget is prepared before any other budget once you prepare the sales budget you will be preparing the production budget production budget is prepared on the basis of sales budget so budgeted sales divided plus closing stock minus opening uh, stock going to give you production the material budget are of two time material usage and material purchase so material usage is going to give you that how much units you are required to produce this much amount of to you know execute or you know do this much amount